morning, everybody. Thank you, Brooke, for the lovely introduction. Thank you. Yes, excited to be here on the first, first gaming track um, and start with eSports. How many, how many of you people are familiar with eSports? Nearly everybody, right? So I can, I can go more deep than, you know, just start very rough. Um, trying to figure out the clicker now, Ugo. Is that me? No, that one is... Nope. It's a start, right? It's the first gaming track, so we... Ah, now it works. Now it works. That's... All good, all good. So, 1981, um, I was seven years old. Uh, probably the first eSports tournament in the world happened um, in Space Invaders. I, my generation, I'm from 74, so I feel extremely lucky that I had the opportunity, the chance to grow up with gaming, right? When I was six, seven, eight, for me, I already had a Atari 2600 in my neighborhood. We could play. Any generation before that really didn't have the chance to grow up with this. So for me and my two brothers, who I'm going to speak a little bit about as well, gaming was the most normal thing in the world. Um, we played football, we went to school, we did all the things other, other kids do, but gaming was a, a part of that, which nowadays is the most normal thing. 30 years ago, 40, 35 years ago, was really an outlier. So what happened to, to all of us, to all, everyone who's involved with gaming for that time, people thought this is like a second grade type of entertainment, right? This is a waste of time, this is a stupid thing, and we really should rather, you know, do more productive things. Anyway, we were really stubborn with this um, and, and, you know, kept, kept playing. And then, then 20 years ago, 1996, seven, a game came out which was called Quake. Quake World, Quake, whatever you call it. It's the first game really for, for us, me, where we could play on the internet against other people. That was a huge difference to anything that happened before. And that, for us and me, was when eSports was born, where we could play against people from other countries, compete with them, and make friends actually through it. Very, very comparable to what we did on the football pitch. Um, so that, for us, it was the same. There were still two problems. A, it was really tiny niche, and B, it was stigmatized. So two things happened then. My mom told me if she would be, you know, our age or would have grown up with video games as well, she would watch this too. This is exciting. This is not boring, what we're doing. And then the second thing that, you know, we were looked down from basically all of society as video gamers was like the idea, and, and specifically as players, right? We were competing. We thought, okay, Let's, let's found this, this company, let's organize these tournaments as well, let's bring these tournaments from the gyms and the cellars and, uh, you know, put aside to big stages. So with ESL, what we wanted to do is to b bring the players actually to the forefront of the tournaments to create stages which I wasn't be able to play on, and my two brothers as well. Both of them left me and thought, you know, it's maybe a crazy idea, but they became soccer professionals, which, you know, shows again that gamers are not, you know, bad people in itself. I stayed stubborn and tried to build an esports league. I'm going to talk a little bit about that going forward. So nowadays it's the most normal thing, right? ESPN says this is, you know, a spectator sport, which rarely happens. It's probably the first spectator sport being born in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. If you look at all the other big sports which are out there today, NFL, NBA, soccer, all of their league systems, everything that's been built there is legacy. All of this has been you know, built 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So the fantastic thing about eSports is that it basically can redefine the way you know, sports are set up. And because it's so diverse across so many games, there is an infinite amount of experiments going on right now in the world. You know, is it a franchise system? Is it an open ecosystem? Is it tournaments? Is it leagues? What is the right way to do? And we're all kind of in the middle of that. 
I can do that very briefly because most people are familiar, right? It's so similar to traditional sports, not the same. The, the physical strength aspect is obviously very, very small to non-existent, but the rest is so close, right? We play in big arenas. We have fans which go crazy for their players, stars, and teams. Uh, we have the stars, which have millions of Twitter followers. Not as much as Ronaldo yet, but they're on their way. The only difference is really a, a pitch, right? The pitch is a video game. It can be a mobile phone. It can be a PC. It can be a console. That, that is really secondary. But um, the, the, these guys have to, have to do unbelievable... Um, unbelievable things. Most of them do like six to seven clicks and decisions a second. So they're blindingly fast. And I always say when, when I hire older people in our company that, you know, one thing you need to understand is that you have the lowest CPU power in this company. You're going to have a lot of experience. You're going to know much more about management than all these younger ones. But each and every one of them can probably sync much faster than you can because he's trained with video games. Video, I can talk about it, but I'll show you some, some things. I'm a huge soccer fan, but this was way bigger than Real Madrid winning their 10th Champions League. This is the most intense game I ever watched. This was like four hours of nail-biting, emotionally roller coaster ride. That was like the closest match ever. Poland, Katowice was the moment that my career just skyrocketed. When I did the famous Pagder move, at that time I didn't think more than thanks to this we won, but after looking at it and everything it brought, I realized that I met something that is going to be there forever. Patient. They lie in wait. They've waited practically a year for this moment. That's a moment I really do remember. It is 2014 ESO Cologne on the 21st of August at Gamescom. 16, 13. It finally happens. Get right has been working years to win that major, and it's unforgettable. We have our champions, the best team in the world. Every single time I watch this video, I get goosebumps. But uh, as said earlier, the pitch is different. But the most important thing about sport, which is emotions, a winner, a loser, and something to strive for, is, is absolutely the same. Target group, um, a little bit of business here. It's obviously very male. Um, that has been with most sports in the past, right? If you look back at you know, where football was 30 years ago, it was a very male sport, even though video games as a whole nowadays are 50-50 between you know, boys and girls, uh, men and women. But for eSports, it's still very, very um, male-driven. It's very global. Everything we do is global. Every content we do uh, produce is global. And due to the fact that you have to have a device to play on, the target group is obviously a little bit above average in terms of buying power and all of the other um, edu education pieces. And it's freaking big, right? I'm not going to speak too much about numbers because they are one side always exciting, but to the other side is boring as well. There is around 300 million eSports fans uh, right now in 2017. Half of them are enthusiasts, that means hardcore fans. Uh, the other half is more casual fans, means uh, the one half watches it every day, and the other half only a couple of hours a week. And it's set to, you know, to, to be larger than, um, in terms of only the enthusiasts, only the hardcore fans, than the NFL in 2018. It's obviously chicken and egg, right? One is global, one is local. But anyway, it just shows where it's going, and it has a high growth rate, um, which I kind of come actually in the next slide to. To set the frame a little bit broader, right? I mean, we're talking about gaming here and esports. Then that's my world. That's my thing. But um, esports is only a part of of that industry. So there's 
depending on which research you look at, between 2.2 and 2.5 billion gamers right now, which is growing at least 5% a year. So the, the underlying trend that I think we all can see is that gaming is already one of the most influential and important media consumption ways in the world. I have the strong belief that you know, gaming is going to be the number one lead media going forward, I don't know, in three, five, ten years, and I don't care, honestly. For me, that's not about speed. It's more about you know, what's ultimately happening. Specifically, if you look at you know, time invested, it, it is such a beautiful, interactive way of spending your time, much better than the traditional video consumption. Sport life is fine. That's not, you know, there's no trouble around that. But anything else is, is, from my point of view, from our point of view, and from the numbers, you know, under heavy scrutiny to be, um, to be uh, overtaken by gaming. And if you just look at two numbers, the gaming industry, I think, in 2016 made $108 billion of revenue. Uh, the, global, the global TV advertisement market, which is only part of you know, the traditional TV market, is $180 billion. So it's not that far off anymore. Then, as I said, the enthusiast, which is always part of the gaming target group, that's 150 million this year. That's growing much faster with 15%. So, you know, however you look at it, if gaming grows, esports as part of gaming grows with it, and a little bit more because it's, you know, the competitive sportive way of look at it. And then the business opportunity, and that's why so many people are excited and hyped about it is that you know, eSports monetizes very, very low. Um, right now, it's three US dollars a fan. It's global revenue that, that eSports does. Compared to other sports, soccer is the highest with $54 per fan. And you know, things like basketball are around 30. So there's a huge, huge gap right now in terms of how eSports monetizes and the impact and size it has. For us, 2013 was one of the biggest years. So we're doing this for a long time, and you know, for the longest time, everything we did was more a vision than a product, right? It was, was something we, we needed to, to really convince people, to, to make them believers. But 2013, we did our first event in a stadium. It's in Poland, Katowice. The mayor of that city called us up and said, yeah, you're doing this cool stuff. We want you to use our beautiful arena. And um, yeah, we, we're doing that nowadays all across the world, filling arenas. Two weeks ago, we were in Hamburg. Uh, three, in, in three weeks, no, two and a half weeks, we're in Oakland uh, in the Bay Area. And these events are really what's, what's moving the market. Every single time that I have a press interview in an arena, usually the guy comes to me and asks me, or tells me, look, I wanted to ask you, you know, if this is really a sport and you know, where the comparison. I've seen it, I've seen the setup here. I get it, so when it's gonna be Olympic, which we're gonna come later to. So that, that is really what, what, what makes it touchable. And it creates incredible numbers. Uh, actually in Cologne, we had uh, uh, 50,000 people a day for three days, so it's a sold out stadium. In Katowice, we had 170,000 peop people attending it. It's connected to a trade fair. So it's actually a mini web summit, if you look at it. We have a stadium there and have the trade fair here. That's exactly what we do in Katowice, uh, Poland, next March, and which is the largest esports event in the world. The games are obviously the basis for it, and that, that, that's one of the things that makes it extremely, extremely different compared to traditional sports. This is, uh, I think, from January this year, uh, there's like there's different criteria how you can look at, but you know, let's assume for a second that this is the right criteria. So there's four, let's call them AAA esports titles. There's a few uh, tier two and a few tier three. One thing happened this year, which uh, is not on that slide, is that a new game came in and overtook nearly all of those games in terms of players and interest and even viewership. Players Unknown Battleground is that, uh, that, that name of that game. Uh, some of you will definitely know it. It's a phenomena. And it's very comparable what five, seven years ago happened with League of Legends. It came out of nowhere, a fairly small development studio. Um, there are thousands of games released every year, right? And there's every one, two, three years, there's one game which comes out of nowhere and totally changes that market. That leads to constant innovation, to constant change. 
and, and in the end of the day as well to broadening that target group. Looking in the future, there might be you know, five AAA, eight AAA, no one knows, but it's certainly not going to get less. And then there's this amazing hype around esports. It's different from market to market. In the US, it's huge. In Germany, it's huge. Uh, in China, it's really big, too. Football teams uh, coming in, big media company, distribution, all of that stuff is, is going really, really fast. As I've been speaking too much, I'm going to need to skip some slides, else I'm going to get kicked off the stage going forward. But I'll, I'll jump very briefly through it. A little bit about ESL. Brand is one of the important things. That's a UK research where we were uh, in front of Formula One, something we're extremely proud of. It's probably not all across the world like that, but still, you know, something which gives us bragging rights is coming back from, from that gaming industry. Um, we, we create content. That's what ESL does. We're an entertainment company. We work with teams, brands. Mercedes-Benz uh, just had their first big activation with us. Intel's been a partner for more than 15 years. The company which you know, single-handedly built eSports uh, as, as, as an, uh, a corporate uh, being involved. We work with many different games. And distribution is obviously key. If you look at how, how we are growing our business, how eSports is growing as a general, it's, it's basically two things. Distribution across the world of the content to get in front of as many people, even though it's, it's available through the internet, but you know, to have it on all these linear telco platforms is a big, big thing for us, where we reach more and more people every day. Our usual large tournaments have around you know, 20 linear takers right now. That's going to increase to 30, 40 next year. So you know, people are really, even who are not so deep into gaming, consuming this content, and it's working. Uh, we have right now a big case with Prozim, where they get above the average uh, market share with eSport magazines. It's not all going to be live, but in some way, Let's play to a, uh, um, um, an ESPN News Center. All of that stuff is still out there to be developed across the world. And there's an audience which is looking and dying for it. Yeah. Two sentences on this. This is how we work. I don't want to jump too much into it. But we believe really in a pyramid. Esports is a full ecosystem. Every single game, you need to think about what happens all across the world with football. So you need. You need products for amateurs where people can come in from zero to hero. That's a great thing. In the whole of eSports, every single player and person can probably come to the top in six or 12 months. Very different than traditional sports where it takes more than 10 to 20 years. So the barrier to entry for a player, which ultimately everything ar 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 revolves around, is very, very low. Uh, Skip is going to, it's very global, it's very global, it's reaching a lot of people. And this has been a slide for the last three years, right? Coming back to what the, the, the guys were asking me all the time when it's going to be Olympic or if it's going to be Olympic. We always said it's not the question of when, it's, a quest, uh, it's not a question of if, it's just purely a question of when. Last Friday, uh, Intel and the IOC announced that uh, the Intel Extreme Masters, which is a product we run together with Intel, is going to be part of the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang next year as a demonstration sport, as a side event. right? So it's not a full medal sport. But again, it's only a question when it's going to happen. Um, the if is already answered and has been answered for the last you know, 10, 15 years. This is a very rough overview. I hope uh, I didn't confuse you too much and uh, went too fast through it. There is probably another three hours I could speak about all of these topics we just touched. The three key takeaways I, I want to give you is it's growing, and it's growing as basis of gaming. It creates amazing content, which you know, just has started to be distributed around the world. And in terms of reaching the target group of that millennials, or however we call it, generation X, Y, Z, young people, basically, it's one of the most effective and one of the few ways how big corporations can talk to this audience in a very natural way. Because in the end of the day, everything we do in eSports, everything a team does, everything a league does, everything a game does is tell a story. And everyone who grew up with it is really great at telling stories. And that's so opposite to traditional advertising 
that um, I believe it has a very, very successful and bright future. Thank you so much.